of the uh, afternoon session. Uh, up next is Joshua Hesketh, uh, who is a software developer currently working on upstream OpenStack. He works from his home in Hobart, and has previously been the president of Linux Australia, co-chair for PyCon AU, and a key organizer for Linux Conf AU, which uh, CFP is coming up, you should attend. Uh, he has an interest in robotics, having completed a degree in mechatronic engineering, and is an active con contributor to the OpenStack Infra and Nova projects. Please make him feel welcome. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you all for coming along this afternoon. Um, I don't need to say much else about myself, except that the call for papers for Linux Conf U closes today, so it's already open, uh, and if you do want to put a paper in, uh, please get on that soon. Uh, so today we're going to do a brief overview. It's a very high-level kind of um, introduction into what is NodePool, uh, which is a system for launching virtual machines and managing those in your test infrastructure. So we're going to have a look at the problem space that we're working in, the problem we want to solve. Then we're going to have a look at what is NodePool and how it solves that problem. Then we'll look at how NodePool is made up of different components, how to deploy and configure those components so they work. Uh, then we'll look at how you interact with NodePool via its API and uh, command line interfaces. And if we have time, we'll look at what's upcoming in the next release uh, and conclude. So why? Well, it's all got to do with testing. I hope we can all agree that testing is a good thing. Uh, there's quite a few different types of testing. They're not necessarily most well-defined, but hopefully some of these are familiar to most of you. Uh, and when you do the testing, you want to do it in a particular environment. And the environment is the area that NodePool is operating in. So we want to do our tests in an environment that is as close as possible to real deployment, so that as you get closer to continuous delivery and continuous deployment, um, what you have tested is ready to go. You want it to be clean for each run, the environment, because in some cases you might have a build system that builds a project into a directory uh, and then deletes the directory and you know, thumbs up, and then the next test comes along and does the same thing. But the build utilities might have installed a system dependency, for example, and a developer may have removed that dependency. The subsequent test run will still pass despite requiring the dependency because it's on the system and it hasn't been properly um, sanitized. So we want the environments to be clean, which also leads into uh, reproducibility. So we want uh, the environment to be the same every time and also reproducible so that if we run a test from our Git history at one point in time and then again next month, uh, we get the same result. We also want to be able to support different environments. So multiple operating systems, different releases of operating systems, if you're supporting current um, Ubuntu and long-term release, for example. Uh, different hardware access, so some tests may require access to specialized hardware or, or GPUs or storage arrays or network devices and so forth. Uh, so you want to be able to manage those tests on those nodes, but as well as your more generic tests might not need to utilize or take up those resources. Uh, and multiple nodes, uh, so you might want to run your tests across multiple virtual machines rather than just one, because what we're really doing here is testing the whole picture. As more and more of our infrastructure gets defined as code through things like Ansible and Puppet and so forth, uh, we're able to get to a point where changes to your infrastructure code are actually able to be tested. So if you've changed the way that your application is deployed and orchestrated, that can be part of your testing infrastructure so that then your application is deployed with those new utilities and the tests are run on top of that. So you can do your smoke tests or your API tests, your integration tests to make sure that the services are still talking to each other. So let me know if I'm going too fast. Uh, so we want a service that works across multiple public and private clouds. Uh, a couple of reasons for this is you may be building in your cheaper private cloud at the moment, and then on high demand, you want to launch tests on public clouds to so scale out. But also, some public clouds aren't the most reliable. So it actually works in your benefit to have multiple ones where if one is unavailable, you're still running your tests on another cloud. We want a service that will scale on demand, so we're not wasting resources having virtual machines just sit there. However, we do want at least a couple around so that the, the boot time for your virtual machines and also the image build time for your virtual machines is not part of your test time. Uh, we want it to handle the whole life cycle of the node as well and do a few nice error testing. So if all of a sudden the node isn't able to be SSH'd into, um, a network issue, a provider issue, an image issue, it could be any number of things. We want a system that will handle that 
and consider that node not part of the available test resources uh, and take corrective action. Uh, why not containers? Uh, you might be thinking, this sounds like a really good application for containers. Do your tests inside one of those? Uh, well, firstly, node pool may support that in the future. That's a different topic. But in our case, because we do want to test the entire infrastructure stack, your um, container orchestration engines, such as Kubernetes and Docker Swarm and so forth, may be part of that. So you may be defining how you're t deploying um, Docker and the associated tools so that as you deploy those tools, you want them to be tested as well. Uh, and since NodePool does just talk to OpenStack uh, APIs, you can also use it to run your tests on bare metal if you have those resources. So it depends on your environment a little bit. Uh, and similarly, why not cloud plugins? Um, Jenkins and I'm sure other CI systems have the ability to launch nodes. Uh, there's a few limitations. Is they're often restricted to one cloud. They often don't let you build a custom image or rebuild custom images. You may have your image that you want to test on uh, built, but you want to rebuild that regularly so that you get latest package updates and things like that for on the system image. Uh, and, and they also don't handle, well, not handling multiple clouds means they don't handle things like um, one cloud being down and so forth. So what, what is node pool? So I already kind of touched on it. It's a system for launching virtual machines uh, for use in testing. Uh, it doesn't have a logo. So this is the OpenStack infrastructure mascot, which is an ant since they build infrastructure. Uh, so it has a number of features. Uh, this is a very high level, has more features, not comprehensive. Uh, it works across multiple clouds, as we mentioned. It will periodically build those images, so you are getting the latest um, released, you know, micro-releases of, of whatever distro images you're using, uh, so that you're always testing against the latest. It handles multiple flavors or sizes, so you, one test might be on a 512 megabyte virtual machine, uh, and another test might be more intensive and need an eight gigabyte virtual machine, and so forth. Uh, it handles the scheduling so that it scales on demand. Um, it watches for nodes to be available or not, which I touched on earlier. Uh, and so far, NodePool can handle thousands of jobs per hour. That is the average load of OpenStack infrastructure. Uh, so they're man it's launching and managing jobs across thousands of nodes. Uh, I don't think we've reached the limit. It can probably do more. And in the new version of uh, NodePool, it will actually scale horizontally in the scheduler as well. So it's in essence, the sky's the limit. At the moment, it integrates with Zool and or Jenkins. Uh, other systems would be very easy to hook into, and we might touch on that. Um, components, so help you kind of visualize where NodePool sits into the continuous integration picture. Uh, NodePool launches your virtual machines in public clouds. At the moment, it launches them on uh, OpenStack clouds. Um, there's, there's a new specification being written to make that pluggable so you can have other clouds and uh, containers, for example. But it needs to know how many uh, nodes to launch on a particular cloud. Um, excuse me. Uh, it does this by looking at Gearman. So Gearman is a job server, uh, which you can say, I want to do this particular job. Then you can have workers subscribe to Gearman and say, I'm able to do this job, and they collect it. So Gearman is what NodePool, uh, well, is the part in the infrastructure picture that is handling the job demand. So NodePool queries Gearman to figure out what is the current demand and boot virtual machines to meet that demand. So Zool, which I talked about a couple of years ago at PyCon AU, uh, if you're interested in it, um, go have a look at that, is uh, a, the central part of the CI system in OpenStack in OpenStack's CI, uh, it is a generic tool, of course, um, that uses Gearman to launch its jobs, but you can use other tools to launch jobs as well. So once it's launched a virtual machine, how do you know what to do with it? I mean, you've just got a machine running somewhere. Well, it, uh, NodePool will attach the virtual machine to a worker. So in this case, it will use the Jenkins API to give a virtual machine to Jenkins and say, here's its credentials so that you can log in and manage it. Uh, and in that way, Jenkins can use the node for its tests. Um, so that every, every node that's launched goes there. But in the same sense, node pool needs to know a little bit about the current state of the node um, so that when a node is being used for a job, it gets marked as being used and it can boot a new one for the next job. Or when the job is finished, it can delete that node and tidy it up. 
So Jenkins publishes an event stream over 0MQ, and node pool subscribes to that. So as Jenkins utilizes nodes, uh, node pool can respond appropriately. Uh, and there are multiple Jenkins um, masters displayed there, uh, and that's simply because using something like node pool will let you scale out Jenkins further than Jenkins is able to by itself. Uh, I talked more on that in my Zool talk. Um, to help complete the picture, node pool works on multiple clouds, uh, and Jenkins looks at Gearman to grab the actual job queue from. So it uses a Gearman as a trigger. Right, so the node pool part in the previous image is actually made up of two things. It's made up of a node pool daemon or node pool D. That's your main scheduler, does all the launching of nodes. Uh, and it's made up of node pool builder. Node pool builder is what builds the disk images and then uploads them to every cloud provider. So the reason uh, that's important is that you, cloud A may have a Ubuntu image where they've modified it for their particular network or changed some packages for whatever reasons they've, they've made. That might be different to cloud B. So by building our own images and uploading them, the disk images that we're building, uh, booting sorry, on any of the clouds are always the same, so we have that consistent environment. Uh, so that building process is an important part of what node pool does. Uh, we don't have time to look at the details there. So deployment. Um, the daemon we just touched on, we just touched on how that needs to talk to Jenkins and Gearman, and we touched on how that needs to boot the image in the cloud. Uh, so in terms of what, what you need to deploy the daemon, it needs a database. Um, it uses SQL Alchemy, so anything that's compatible with, I think the only one that's actually tested is MySQL though, so that's generally what's uh, denoted as supported. It also needs a Zookeeper instance. That's not the conference management software, that's the centralized database and configuration tool. Uh, it uses Zookeeper to talk to the node pool builders. So it'll, tells, um, it'll put into the Zookeeper configuration, I need these nodes. Uh, disk image types, and the node pool builders will look at that and then build those. Uh, node pool builders use a tool called Disk Image Builder. That's um, a generic OpenStack tool, but it can build disk images for any cloud, so it can output them in different formats, and then it will upload them to clouds. <coughs> uh, there's a node pool command line interface which talks to the, <coughs> excuse me, the daemon and the database so that you can query how many nodes are building, how many nodes are booting, what the current states are. Uh, and optionally, if you have a stats D type service, you can um, use that for reporting metrics, how many nodes are currently booting and building, et cetera. So node pool D is, is just a daemon. You could run it in a screen session if you wanted, and that would be adequate. You can use your favorite init system or, or however you choose to deploy the software. I'm not going to go too much into those details because it's probably environment specific to whether or not you want to deploy in RHEL or something else. Uh, if you are interested, we, OpenStack Infrastructure, have published a bunch of Puppet and Ansible modules that will help you deploy it, so that will make your life easier. And Node Pool Builder is the same. It's a daemon. You need to deploy it somewhere. Again, in a screen would be fine. Uh, you can also deploy the builder on the same uh, machine as the daemon. Uh, but if you need it to scale out, because it is quite a heavy workload, you can scale that out horizontally. Uh, did I? Yep, I did. Uh, so th this is just to give you an idea of, we've sent, we send uh, all the statistics of OpenStack Infra to a stats D database and then graph it with Grafana. Um, and this is actually live, so this is what it's currently doing. How many nodes are ready across how many um, different CI systems, uh, use nodes, how many nodes are deleting, how many nodes are building, and so on and so forth. So the, there's quite some comprehensive statistics that you can gain. So hopefully that gives you kind of an idea of where node pool fits into the CI picture and how to configure it and what it looks like, or how to deploy it, sorry. Configuration we'll look at now. There's two files that node pool uses. The secure.conf is where the credentials are stored, so you have your database credentials uh, and then the API credentials for talking to Jenkins. And then the node pool.yaml is kind of your master file that describes your CI system. Uh, so the first ones are kind of just connecting things up. So you have where you're keeping the elements that make up your disk images. Um, unfortunately, I don't have time to go into disk image builder, but that's um, where that comes from. Uh, image directory is just a working directory for building the images. You probably just want that to be on a really large volume. 
uh, some cron jobs, so it'll clean up nodes that get stuck in bad states like deleted. Uh, it can SSH into the nodes every 15 minutes to check if that they're still alive or if they've disappeared. Connect the 0MQ publishers that I mentioned before so it can keep getting updates of the states of the node. Connect the Gearman servers so that you can understand the load of the system. Connect the Zookeeper servers so that you can communicate with the node pool builders. So that's just kind of getting everything connected. You can pretty much copy this and change the host names and you're there. Then you have the four main parts, which are the disk images, labels, providers, targets, that describe what we're doing. So the disk images describe the images to build. So take a Ubuntu minimum um, and apply these shell scripts and these packages however I want them to get them into a state that I need it, and then that's uploaded to the cloud. Labels describes the type of jobs. So this is when a job goes into Gim and it says which label it needs. Uh, so it could be like, I want really big machines, so use a label called big. I need lots of machines, so use a label called multi or graphics cards or, or however. Providers are the clouds to boot the images on. Uh, and targets are which Jenkins masters or other systems to then um, allocate the node to. So we're going to look at those four sections uh, in detail over the next four slides. So here's the first one, disk images. So I, I already kind of touched on this. You describe what you want the name of the image to be and then what that image is made up of. So we're actually building uh, an environment based on Ubuntu Precise using these um, uh, elements, which are part of Disk Image Builder. If you're interested, go have a look at that. But what, all you need to know for the purposes of this talk is a consistent image is built, so that will be consistent across clouds. Uh, the labels, so this is the part that um, lets you define how many nodes are part of a label and any kind of last minute setup scripts that you need. So after node pool boots uh, an image on a cloud, you can run some last minute prep steps before the node is marked as ready and associated to a Jenkins or Azul. Um, so that's a unique name to tie it. The disk image to use for this type of label as per the previous slide um, and which providers are able to boot that uh, particular node. Um, and so here are the providers. So um, basically for every cloud you have and every region within the cloud you list a provider. Uh, and you have some pretty generic configuration. Um, the cloud here is from OS client config which just lets you keep your credentials somewhere nice and neat like ECT um, at OpenStack or in a user directory or in the current working directory. But alternatively, you can just provide the authentication details right here, the username, password, URL. Um, and then you have the region, uh, max servers. So how many servers can run on this no, um, cloud? So if you want to limit some clouds um, more than others, which is useful if the cloud is donating resources or is more expensive than another cloud. Uh, and then some timeout things, different clouds kind of perform better. So. We want to be able to tune that on a per cloud basis. Um, and then the interesting one here is the images, which um, I couldn't fit into the one page, so it's across here. Uh, that basically describes on this cloud for the Ubuntu trusty disk image, uh, we want to use a flavor, um, which is a, a node type with at least eight gigabytes of RAM. You can also use a name filter to help match that down because there might be multiple flavors providing that much RAM. Uh, and lastly, you provide a few things that are given to Nova, which is the OpenStack um, uh, service. The boot on, on boot time, you can give it the private key um, and some metadata and uh, what's the other thing that you can give it? Uh, whether or not to use cloud in it. Um, then the next section is the targets. So this is just a list of uh, Jen Jenkins masters or Zool that you have the nodes then attached to. Um, it will basically, I think, just go through them so that you get an even load. Right, interacting with Nopal. Uh, so this is the Nopal CLI. Um, it looks quite verbose, but it's just made up of a bunch of subcommands you can see down the bottom. Uh, we won't go over all of them. Some of them are a little boring, but it's... Um, basically the main way of interacting with node pool as a user. So you can do things like disk image build image list. So this will give you 
uh, all the images that are either built or currently building, which disk image, um, so node pool builder host is currently doing that. Uh, and then you can also, oh, and, and, and see which state uh, it is in, if it's building, uploading, ready, deleting, or failed. Uh, then you can have a look at the, one, the images that are then actually uploaded to providers. Unfortunately, it didn't fit all this in one slide, but oh, I've lost my cursor. Um, yeah, you've got the state and how long that image has been available for. So that's um, to do with all the images that are uploaded to all the individual clouds. So for every image, it goes to every cloud. And there's usually at least two versions of an image um, available so that if the newest build fails, whatever, we can just go in, delete the newest build, and it will just revert to using the previous build. Uh, node pool list, so this is the main list of nodes that are currently booted in every cloud. Uh, who they're attached to, so they're attached to a different Jenkins master, the host name, the node name, um, the server IDs, IPs, uh, the state it's currently in. So if you have a particular node that failed for whatever reason, you can put it in a hold state so it doesn't get deleted. Um, and you can add a comment, as you can see, someone has done there. Uh, so the different states a node can be in uh, building, ready, use, deleted, hold, or test. Um, so hopefully that's self-explanatory. The test is basically you get the node booted, but you don't actually give it to a provider to, to use, so you can come in and use it. Um, so in my rehearsals, I actually seem to have gone a bit slower than what I've actually gone and didn't want to go into this to too much detail because I didn't think I'd have time. Uh, if you want to use something that's not Zor and not Jenkins, you want to be able to use Node Pool to manage your pool of resources uh, for your environment. You might even use it for something that's not a testing environment. Uh, you can. So the main things you have to do is provide um, some sort of zero MQ of the node states. So whether or not a node is in use, needs deleting, uh, and so forth, so node pool knows when to release them. Um, you have to have the nodes attached by Gearman if you're not using Jenkins API. So that's quite easy. Node pool will just say to Gearman, hey, I have this um, node available and you can just subscribe to that as part of the Gearman protocol in whatever program you're using and pick up on that node and basically take it. So you say, this one's mine. Uh, and optionally, you can have the load determined by Gearman. I should note that you can actually get away with not using Gearman at all, at which point node pool just works in a replacement sort of um, algorithm. So for every node that is finished and gets deleted, a new one can be booted. Uh, so it doesn't really predict load. Um, you can see this implemented in Zool uh, in the current master branch. You have a look at the Ansible launcher. One of the reasons I didn't want to go into this into too much detail is that an upcoming release of Node Pool, um, it's probably a little bit off still, but it will mostly be redundant. All of this will be pretty much done via Zookeeper. So you can have a look at the data structures within the current Zookeeper um, uh, environment to kind of get an idea of how that will look. Uh, so we do have time to touch briefly on the future. Zool v3 is the really interesting thing that's upcoming. The OpenStack infrastructure team will hope to have that deployed in the next few months. But it will allow for some nice things, such as defining your jobs in individual repositories, native support for multi-node. So Zool will be able to request from node pool different types of nodes per job. Whereas at the moment, it just says, I want this label. And node pool gives it however many nodes are associated with that label. Uh, jobs are basically defined in Ansible um, and integrates with more systems such as GitHub and other things that aren't Garrett. So that's Zool v3, which um, is a different topic. However, Node Pool is also kind of evolving with it. So Node Pool will come with new drivers so you can support containers or other clouds and so forth. Then, and the Node Pool launches that I mentioned before will be scalable. Um, so I think we're at time. Uh, hopefully, that's given you a good overview of where Node Pool fits into your CI story, um, how to deploy it and how it kind of works. And whether or not you want to use it in your environment probably depends on the scale you're operating at. This is designed for very large scale CI systems, but you could use it at a small scale as well. Um, and yes, any questions?
All right, uh, I got a quick one to start off with. Um, and I confess my not very great familiarity with OpenStack, but is it possible to um, configure either NodePool or OpenStack to point at spot instances on EC2, for example, to minimize cost? Uh, I don't know how that's handled in OpenStack. I don't know if that's a common feature, because uh, I'm not, also not very familiar with the um, uh, Amazon equivalent. Uh, but when the upcoming drivers are pluggable in node pool, that will be really trivial. Um, you'll be able to point a spot in just then. Cool. Yeah. Thanks for the talk, by the way. All Anybody right. else? Thanks for the talk, Josh. Um, Sorry? I was wondering how small is small? How many nodes before it's worth the effort getting this up and running? It kind of depends on what you want to do. Like, if you're testing many different types of nodes, so you want different operating systems, different hardware requirements, graphics cards, and so forth, it's probably immediately useful because um, doing that in something else, like Jenkins, would require a lot of fiddling. Where and, and also, if daily new image builds are important to you in clean environments, then yeah, it's very helpful. Um, otherwise, it really depends on kind of whether or not you want to do it. It's not difficult to deploy. Uh, probably the most difficult thing you hear is at the moment it's a little bit limited to Jenkins and Zool, so it depends whether or not they're part of your uh, infrastructure. If they are, then it makes a lot of sense. If they're not, you probably have to do a cost-benefit analysis of the work to get it there. Anybody else? Uh, thanks for the talk. Is, okay. um, I might have missed this bit. Is NodePool completely heterogeneous in terms of the, the server hardware as well as the VMs it launches in terms of architecture and, and so on? Uh, so you, NodePool runs on, on Linux uh, and can run anywhere and uh, it just talks to OpenStack APIs. So it depends on the nodes that OpenStack is booting. So you could boot Windows nodes and... Um, well, I didn't, didn't mean the OS so much, but more the, the actual arch architecture of the hardware that it's running on. So PowerPC, x86... Or, you know, um, sure. I, so node pools or Python, and I don't really see why it wouldn't work on any other architectures. Uh, certainly if you're booting on a cloud that has PowerPC uh, node types, it will definitely support that. So you just, in the provider part of the configuration, you just define which nodes you want to be booted, uh, and if that's a PowerPC or an a uh, Atom or something else, that, that would work just fine. All right, any more questions? Okay, well in that case, uh, thank you very much for your talk. Uh, we Sorry? have a mug for you from the committee. Excellent. Add to my collection. Yes. <laughs> thank you very All much. Right, one more round of applause, please. <laughs> and we'll get started in about uh, 12 minutes for the final session before tea. Thank you.